Now, <coughs> members of the jury, we are nearing the end of this very long-running case with which we have been involved, legal aid on trial. We are surpassing the record of the McDonald's libel case, which lasted for seven years, with 314 days spent in court, making it the longest action in English legal history. We are even beating the most expensive case in English legal history, that of BCCI versus the Bank of England, which cost the bank £73 million in legal fees. <coughs> Perhaps this prosecution of legal aid is more akin to Dickens' Jarndyce and Jarndyce, which he said, drones on. This scarecrow of a suit has, in course of time, become so complicated that no man alive knows what it means. Anyway, ours has been outrageously lengthy, and it has been consuming lawyers' time for more years than I care to remember. It would be impossible to sum up briefly. What follows is but a review of some of the evidence we have heard, although I'm sure that Learned Defence Counsel will have much to add in a moment or so. Members of the jury, let's start by reminding ourselves of the origins of legal aid, which has been under scrutiny since its inception. We heard that a unified legal aid system was introduced in 1949 in the Legal Aid and Legal Advice Act. The Rushcliffe Committee, who recommended the Act, suggested a system should be set up whereby lawyers would cater for the needs of the poor as well as for the rich. The committee rejected a service by salaried lawyers specifically orientated to the particular problems of the poor. Legal aid services were to be provided by independent legal professionals, but paid for by public funds. The poor could receive legal advice, so be able to prosecute and defend a legal right, and both counsel and solicitors would benefit from fair remuneration for their services. Alongside social security, housing, education and the NHS, it was realised that equality of access and the right to representation before the law was fundamental to a just society. So, members of the jury, what is the current state of play? As I have said, legal aid has been subject to constant review. The latest round, the Carter Reforms, which has been mentioned many times in our trial, is in fact the fifth major review of legal aid. That review has taken place alongside the introduction of a new legal services bill and the reintroduction of means testing in the magistrates' court. It is agreed by all parties that the legal aid system in England and Wales is one of the best in the world. We have heard that this is partly due to an ongoing recognition that our international obligations and those under Article 6, the right to a fair trial, should be met at all, or at least some, costs. So, members of the jury, what is that cost? The prosecution say, and here is the rub, that while our legal aid system may be the best in the world, it is by far the most expensive. The legal aid budget has increased from 1.5 to 2 billion pounds since 1997. Our 2 billion pound spend a year, say the prosecution, is unacceptably high, when France, for example, spends a mere £250 million pounds a year. The defence, for their part, accepts legal aid spent has traditionally been greater than other systems, although they say this is attributable in part to the nature and requirements of our adversarial system. They point out that total government expenditure on public services has increased by nearly 60%. Meanwhile, the costs of running a private practice have risen by about 60%, whilst rates of pay for legal aid work have effectively been frozen. Members of the jury, what is it that Lord Carter was asked to do? As you know, the prosecution rely on the evidence gathered by Lord Carter and his review team. He was commissioned to review legal aid expenditure with a view to producing a strategy to deal with the alleged £100 million or so overspend. The prosecution say it was an extensive inquiry, lasting over a year, but the defence say it was conducted in a scattergun manner, and that such a change to the legal aid system is worthy of a public independent inquiry or a royal commission. At the very least, the defence say, this matter should not be determined until the Constitutional Affairs Committee have completed their own inquiry. 
We heard evidence as to the changes proposed by Lord Carter. In essence, we were told that instead of paying lawyers for the number of hours they have actually worked on a case, a 